Well, if you would, take your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. As uh, last week, uh, we talked about the gospel and politics. Really, the next three weeks are a follow-up to that. Uh, it's how we are the church uh, in the world today. And one of the things that we need, I believe, is a higher understanding of who the church is. Just like uh, we talked about Jesus and wanted to make much of him during this season, we want to be sure that we make much of his bride, the church, as well. And so there's a saying that I have used often with you. I'm going to use it often in this series. We don't go to church. We are the church. Say it with me. We don't go to church. We are the church. One more time. We don't go to church. We are are the church. And it seems like 2020 has been a hard time for the church, doesn't it? For years, we've been reading about the statistics, declining church numbers. We've been talking about the, the struggle of churches to maintain membership and influence in our culture. Then we hit a year like this and the COVID-19 pandemic and all of a sudden we're having to find totally new ways of gathering the church and going online with church. Many of our people are still, of course, watching church at home online. And so you begin to think about all of the challenges that the church faces in traditional times. You know, we all know the, the horror stories about churches that have split over the color of the church carpet because they couldn't agree or the number of parking spaces or what the church budget was supposed to be. You mix all of that together and it seems like we would be really discouraged right now. And so it reminds me of a story of a man who was driving home from work. And this guy drove past the town's little league field and he said, you know what, I could use a little break. I'm just gonna pull in and watch a couple innings of this little league game and watch some boys have some fun. So when he stood by the fence in left field and he was kind of watching the game and he, he calls over to the little left fielder, you know, guy with his baggy pants on and his baseball cap down. And he said, hey buddy, what's, what's the score? The kid looked at him and he grinned and he said, well, mister, it's 14 to nothing. We're behind. And the guy said, why are you smiling? And the kid said back, you know, I, I, the reality is we haven't been up to bat yet. <laughs> and so I'm with the little kid, right? The reality is, is that I'm not discouraged. And here's the reason why. God is not surprised by anything that's happening in our culture. A pandemic didn't catch him off guard. What's happening in this election didn't catch him by surprise. I believe one of the things that God is doing in 2020 is he is purifying his church, especially in the evangelical South where there's a whole lot of show up and see and be seen stuff. I think what Jesus is looking for is people who are serious, not to just attend a church service, not to show up for some programs, but he is looking for disciples who want to multiply disciples. I believe that Jesus is mobilizing his church in a way that we haven't seen in our lifetimes. And when we get the idea that we don't go to church, right, this is not just something we do, but it is who we are, God's people, knitted and fit together in a body that he has designed to accomplish his plans and purposes. When our mind set begins to change, I believe that we're gonna see God do amazing things. I love what John Stott says in his book, The Living Church. He says, the church lies at the very center of the eternal purpose of God. It's not a divine afterthought. It's not an accident of history. On the contrary, the church the church is God's new community for his purpose conceived in a past eternity being worked out in history and to be perfected in a future eternity is not to just save isolated individuals and so perpetuate our loneliness, but rather to build his church. That is to call out of the world a people for his own glory. That's what we're a part of when we are a part of the church, a people called out of the world, knitted together and built together by his spirit for his glory. That's what's at stake when we say we are the church. And I'm encouraged that the apostle Peter wrote to a suffering, poor, struggling, persecuted first century church, the words that we're about to read today. We need to make much of Jesus 
and we need to make much and be committed to his church, the bride. Will you stand with me in honor of God's word as we read from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all slander. Like newborn infants, desire the pure milk of the word so that you may grow up into your salvation if you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by people but chosen and honored by God, you yourselves as living stones, a spiritual house, are being built to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in scripture, see I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and honored cornerstone, and the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. So honor will come to you who believe, but for the unbelieving. The stone that the builders rejected, this one has become the cornerstone. And a stone to stumble over and a rock to trip over. They stumble because they disobey the word. They were destined for this. But you, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of the darkness and into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. Pray with me this morning. Lord Jesus, thank you that you are the rock, the cornerstone upon which our faith rests. But upon that rock, you allow us to be chiseled and carved into living stones for your glory. Help us to see and understand the importance of this, that you are building for yourself a people to bring you glory. And that's what we wanna be a part of today, Lord Jesus. So convict us, challenge us inspire us by your spirit. And it's in his name we pray these things. And all God's people said, amen. amen. You may be seated this morning. So Peter, his name meaning what? The rock, his given name, do you remember in the Bible? was Simon. Simon, Peter, he was often called, because Jesus looked at him and said, Peter, you are the rock, and upon you I will build my church. After Peter's struggles to come to grips with Jesus and his mission, after his denial of Jesus, after Jesus restored him, Peter clearly understood what it meant to be a living stone. And so I love this about Peter because we know, right, his, his Jewish name would have been Simon Bar-Jonah, so son of John, right? So his name Rock Johnson, like you can't even make that up, right? It's just there in the Bible. That gives you a little bit of idea about Peter's identity and who he was. And so Jesus looked at a guy named Rock Johnson and said, I'm gonna build my church on you. And here Peter points to the fact that Jesus is the cornerstone. Of course, God is gonna use Peter, but Peter extends that analogy to each and every one of us. And that's point number one for us this morning because Peter wants to remind his church and he wants to remind us who we are, that we are being built together into a living house. We are being forged and built together. Now remember, Peter wrote these words in the middle of the first century. What had happened to the early church? Well, they were misunderstood. They were persecuted. The emperor Nero, around the very time that Peter wrote this letter, recognized that Christians were an easy scapegoat for the problems of the Roman Empire. We see much the same today. Sometimes Christians are blamed for what's wrong in our culture. And so persecution, active persecution, was starting to break out against the church. And the church, again, didn't seem impressive at the time. It was young. It was full of people who didn't fit in any other religion or part of society. It was poor, generally. They didn't have a lot going for them. They didn't have anything going for them politically during that time. And yet, Peter saw through the eyes of Jesus who his church truly was. And he reminded them, you are being built into a living house. 
And so this metaphor, right, we have to work with a little bit because how many stonemasons do we have in the audience today? Anybody out there a stonemason? All right, we didn't have any at nine o'clock either. So anytime we look at these word pictures, and we're grateful for word pictures, we know that Peter's grabbing for a lot of them in his writings. Paul does too, to try to help us understand things. Uh, since there's not very many stonemasons around today, I think the better analogy for all of us who are parents and grandparents are Legos. Can I get an amen? All right, we've all played with Legos before. And we know Legos come in what? Different shapes and sizes. And so some Legos are this long, right? Some of them are this tiny. And then you get down and you're building a Lego with your kid and you can't find that one tiny little piece that you need to complete the project and it drives you crazy. Building blocks. The idea is simple. We all come in different shapes and sizes. God made it that way. Look around this room. There is a brilliant diversity of life experiences and spiritual gifts and talents. Some of you, right, are high capacity people. Your Lego block is like this long. You can just connect with people and have relationships for days. Others of you, right, you're like, your Lego is like this big. You only have this much capacity for people. But your brick is just as important as the others because they all have to be there for the set to be complete. And that's one of the things that Peter wants the early church to know is that each one of you, each little Lego brick by itself isn't that impressive. But put together, it can complete an impressive project. And so this was so foreign to the world in which it emerged, but it's so brilliant because Christianity emerged in a world in which people were all about their religiosity, just like they are today. Every religion had its temples. Every religion had its priests. Every religion had its sacrifices. And so I love what the renowned British pastor, Dick Lucas, once said, he preached a sermon in which he recounted an imaginary conversation between an early Christian and her neighbor in Rome. Ah, the neighbor says to the Christian, right? I hear that you're religious. Great, well, religion can be a good thing, right? So where's your holy place? We don't have a temple, replies the Christian. Jesus is our temple and we are the living stones. Oh, oh, no temple? Well, well, then where do your priests work and do their rituals? We don't have priests to mediate the presence of God, replies the Christian. Jesus is our high priest, and we are all the royal priesthood. But wait, no priests, where, where do you offer, offer your sacrifices and, and acquire the favor of your God? We don't need a sacrifice, replies the Christian. Jesus was our sacrifice once and for all. What kind of religion is this, sputters the pagan neighbor? And the Christian responds, it's no religion at all. This is about a relationship with the living God of the universe. You see, this is what makes us unique and distinct because Christianity isn't dependent on buildings created by man. We use these buildings, we're grateful for them. They're tools. God uses space that we devote to him. But God doesn't dwell in temples made by hands. Instead, in the new covenant, Jesus has chosen to indwell his body, the church, with his living spirit. So God's architecture is biological. That means, it's what a paradox, we are living stones. My seminary professor taught me, anytime you hear a paradox, it's a truth standing on its head trying to get your attention. So pay attention when Peter says we're living stones, right? What's the, the good quality of a stone? Well, it's solid, it's dependable, or at least it should be. But what's the beauty of living? Well, we have an opportunity to grow. We have an opportunity to become more like Christ, to become more solid, to become more dependable and more usable for his kingdom. That's why Peter starts that passage out the way he does, because he says our life matters because we want to be good building materials in the hands of our Father that he is building together. And so what a brilliant word picture this is, because the thing that we need to know is that God is building us into something amazing. He is building us into something of his own design. And so it's a tragedy to me today that so many people have a low view of the church. They treat the church like it's a country club, right? I throw a little money in the offering plate and then it provides the good and services that I want. Some treat the church like it's a cruise ship. They're looking for an attractive variety of programs that entertain them, things for their kids to do, right? And if we're not careful, we slip into this consumer mindset about the church. 
When Jesus says, no, no, I am building you into something together. Point number two, the second metaphor that Peter uses. Who we are, part two, we are brought together into a royal priesthood. We're brought together into a royal priesthood. Look what it says in verse nine. But you are a chosen race. And you better remember the playground in elementary school or junior high? There was always a ball game going on of some kind, wasn't there? It was kickball, a little touch football, maybe pick up the game of basketball. Do you remember how there was always that one kid in your school who was the best athlete? And it didn't matter what sport it was you guys were playing at lunchtime, he was going to dominate the game. And do you remember when you guys, everybody lined up and they started to pick sides and of course he'd be a captain. And then, you know, for his kickball team, he looks at you and says, hey, you on my team. And you were like, yes, today is going to be a good day, right? We're going to win. We're going to dominate. I'm going to get to brag all afternoon to my buddies, right, about how good I was had nothing to do with you, right? You guys are gonna win because the dude had picked you, right? The, the, the best athlete in the school, you were on his team. Now I want you to think about this. God, when he called you to salvation said, I want you on my team. You were a part of my chosen people. I picked you. There's a certain something that I have called you out of the world to do, to be a part of my very people. So you, you are a chosen race. You are a royal priesthood. Let's stop and think about what that means for a moment. Royalty. How many of you in here would like to be royalty, right? Yeah, you can put your hand up. We're still infatuated with it today. Right, the British royalty, right? All kinds of attention. Makes the headlines all the time. Why? Because there's something in us that longs to be royal. But the people who read this, if you came of a Jewish background, they knew most of them. I'm not of the line of King David. If you were a Gentile, all of them knew, right? I'm, I'm not in the household of the emperor. I have no hope of being royalty. And Peter says, oh, wait, you do. You may not have earthly royal blood in your veins, but when the king of all kings died on the cross for you, well, then you became a part of his bloodline. You have royal blood in you as well. You are a son or daughter of the most high king. And so you put royal together with priesthood and then you get something altogether more powerful. What was it about priests that was so special? Well, priests had access to the holy place. Only a priest in any religion had direct access to God. They were set apart as a special group of people and they knew all of the rituals. And now Peter is telling all of us in Christ Jesus, there is one mediator between God and man and it is Jesus Christ. And once you have a relationship with him, then you too are a priest. And so what a privilege that you have access to the holy. But not only that, there's a responsibility, isn't there? Because as a priest, a priest was supposed to minister to the people. So you stand at the intersection of holy God and broken man. And so that's what I'm calling you to as a people. What a high calling, what a high role and responsibility. You're a chosen race. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation, that word holy. You're set apart. You're unlike any other group of people on this earth. And you are a people for his possession. You're a people who belong to God. How valuable does that make you? Now, we have a little quirk in our culture today. And that's that people really love stuff that has been owned by celebrities. It's weird, right? So I got online, Googled a couple of things this week. Justin Timberlake, a few years ago, uh, goes to breakfast, leaves his French toast behind on his plate. Server scoops it up, posts it on eBay, sells it for $1,300. What's wrong with us? <laughs> right, it's so weird, like use French toast. No different from the French toast you left on your plate this morning. But Justin Timberlake took a bite of it, so it's worth something. Willie Nelson, a few years ago, his famous braided hair, cut it off, gave it to a buddy here in Nashville. That musician died. His wife found it, right? Was like, I don't know what to do with this. Sold it. $37,000 for two braids of Willie Nelson's hair. People are crazy. 
J.K. Rowling decided to sell a few years ago the chair that she wrote the first Harry Potter book in. You know what it sold for? $400,000. Just the chair. Who are these people and where do they get that kind of money? That's what I want to know, right? So think about this. If we are willing to give that kind of worth to something possessed by a celebrity, how much value are you if you are owned by God? You are a people for his possession. How valuable does that make you to him? That's what Peter's reminding us. You have been brought together in a royal priesthood. And guess what? This royal priesthood doesn't exist to serve itself. It exists to do something. That's our third point this morning. So what we do, right? We bring all we have for the cause of Christ. After Peter lays out these beautiful pictures of what we are, who we have in Jesus, he says, why does he do this? So, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of the darkness and into his marvelous light. You see, with our identity as living stones, with our identity as a royal priesthood, we also have a responsibility. I have an adopted son. When he became a strother, right? All of the privileges of being a strother became his. Guess what also became his? All of the chores. You're part of the family. You have a responsibility. God says, you're a part of the family. Now you have a role. What is that role? To be his witness to have those gospel conversations, to declare the praises with your words and with your life of him who has called you out of darkness and into light. I am loving some of the stories I'm hearing right now about the gospel conversations that you guys are having. Because as the world turns darker, more people are looking at you and saying, what's different about you? And you get a chance to say, let me tell you about the one who's called me out of darkness and into light. And boom, you're testifying, you're witnessing. I love it. And that's what we're called to do. What does our role as priests look like? Back up in verse five, remember Peter said, we're being built into a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ Jesus. So if we are priests, what are the sacrifices that we offer? Look at me, look with me at uh, Romans chapter 12, verse one. What does is, what is that kind of a sacrifice look like, right? We don't, we don't kill animals anymore, right? We're not in the old covenant, we're in the new. So what does this look like for me? Well, here's what it looks like, your life. Romans 12, verse one, therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present what? Yourself, your bodies, as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your acceptable act of worship. In other words, our whole self, our whole self. We love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. It all belongs to him. And a living sacrifice is a beautiful thing. But what's the problem with a living sacrifice? It can crawl off the altar. And so every day, we have to get up and remind ourselves, right? Jesus, you have saved me. You've put me into your family. I have been rescued by your gospel. Now my life is yours. Everything, my time, my talent, my treasure, my testimony, my witness, right? All things that I have belong to you. The author of Hebrews puts it this way, Hebrews 13, verse 15. Therefore, let us through him continually offer up to God a sacrifice of praise. That is the fruit of our lips that confess his name. So we point back to Jesus every chance we get. In verse 16, don't neglect to do what is good and to share. For God is pleased with such sacrifices. So when we recognize that it all belongs to him and we get to share that with others, that's one of the ways that he works in and through us. Again, serving a holy God in the middle of broken man. When the world sees that kind of love, we put the same kind of intentionality into living that way that we do our own concern about our entertainments and our lifestyle and all of those things, then God is glorified and much is made of Jesus. And he says, remember this. Don't ever forget, once you were outsiders, you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Remember this once, right? You didn't know what mercy was, but now you know 
So extend that to others with the way that you live. So our takeaways today, number one, we are the church in our lifestyle. We are the church in the way that we live. Those building blocks, those bricks, again, we want them to be as good as they can possibly be for God to use. So look at verse one of the passage we read, 1 Peter 2, 1. Therefore, what? Rid yourselves, get rid of all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all slander. Peter specifically lists things that I believe drive a wedge between people. And so he intentionally says, get rid of that stuff, get it out of your life. Right now, are we seeing a world that's full of malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander? Yes. Turn on your news, scroll through your social media feeds. These five things are all over it. When you don't give in to this way of life, then it reflects that you know Jesus and it's gonna stand out against the world. Number two, we are the church in our unity. We are the church in our unity. Here's a picture again of this word picture that Peter's been using, bricks. Bricks seem pretty ordinary. I know I feel pretty ordinary most days, right? You see these bricks, right? There's some of them that have little imperfections in them. That's all of us. There's no perfect person. There's no perfect church for that matter. But what the Holy Spirit is doing, and this is why we have to have a biblical understanding of church. What God is doing is he is building something far beyond our wildest imagination. With each individual brick, he's building something that looks like this, right? A cathedral, something beautiful. And this is just a physical representation of a spiritual reality that Peter is speaking to. So this is why I'm grieved today when people try to date the church instead of committing to the church. This is why I'm grieved today when people disfellowship over things that are lesser than biblical things. This is why I'm bothered deeply today that in America we church shop and church bounce all around because what the Bible tells us is, is each of us are unique craftily, uniquely crafted and placed in a body of believers that God is using, that Jesus is using to reflect his glory to the world. I don't get to just take out my brick whenever I want to and walk over here with it. We need a higher understanding of what the church is and what we're called to do. I agree 100% with a pastor who wrote this. The only perfect church is the heavenly assembly. And it does not meet at 10 o'clock each Sunday, a short drive from your house, right? There's no perfect church. We're not perfect. Any church you visit isn't perfect. But what does he go on to say? So until you're called to join the, the masses around God's throne, you are called to belong to a church in which others will get things wrong and so will you. We're not a perfect church, but we can be a committed church. We can be a church full of disciples who are together allowing Jesus to forge us together, to knit us together, to present to the world a picture of unity in diversity. Because again, we're different, but that reflects God's glory all the more. When the world sees a bunch of people who don't have any other reason to be united come together, it's breathtaking. And when we serve and praise and live and love and give together, the world says, I want to know who that God is. I want to know. And this leads us to our third takeaway this morning. We are the church in our witness. So proclaim the praises. Thank God for the good things. Find ways to point to him. Because in a dark world, the light needs to shine the one who's called you out of the darkness and into the light. We naturally praise what we enjoy. And so let's enjoy what God has entrusted to us. Let's appreciate each other and what God has given us in his family. As I said, we're not perfect, but the church is God's perfect plan to advance his gospel in the world. And so let's enjoy what we get to do together. And you know what, church, I need you. I need those text messages and those calls that say, hey, I'm praying for you. I need to stand here on Sunday 
and I need to hear you sing, I will build my life on the firm foundation of Jesus. Do you know why? Because my voice alone isn't enough to praise our great big God. I need your voice. We need each other. You heard J.D. and Carrie share about the people who blessed them when they said, hey, the Lord put this on my heart to do this for you guys, so I'm doing it. We have been the recipients. I know many of you in this room have been of the love of Jesus. So let's declare with our lives what we profess to believe. Let's make sure that we make much of Jesus and let's make much of his bride, the church as well. Jesus gave his life for his church, for his people. We give our lives to him. Will you bow your heads with me this morning as we come to this time of response? Some of you today may need to take that step and say, you know what? It's time. It's time for me to jump into the body of believers called the church at Station Hill because I want to be a living stone that finds its place in whatever God is building here. Maybe for you today, it's a realization that I wanna be a part of God's people. And so today I turn from my sin and myself to become an adopted child in God's kingdom with all of the privileges and all of the responsibilities that come with it. But I want to give my life to the very cause of Christ. Whatever it is today, whatever response you need to make, I pray that you make much of Jesus and his bride, the church, because when we do things God's way, it takes a breath away. Lord Jesus, we love you. Help us to respond to you in spirit and in truth as your people. And it's in your name we pray, amen. Let's continue to worship together. to love his bride.